Hello once again, and Tony here, and after experiencing the absolute crumminess of Ratatouille, I think it's time to move on to something that has a lot more culture and class. I'm of course talking about my review of Gaia Sariajo's La Mur de Luan, live from the Metropolitan Opera House, which I saw at the Kino in De Cultur Brauerei. The conductor was Susanna Melki. The production was done by Robert Lepage. The assistant director was Sybil Wilson. The costumes and sets were done by Michael Curry. The lights were handled by Kevin Adams and the cinematographer was Gary Halverson. Now, before I get on to the actual review, there was in fact a real life person who was also one of the characters in this particular opera. And that was Prince Geoffrey Roudel, who was a troubadour during the 12th century. And he was very well known for his idea of a distant love in a lot of his songs. And of course, there was a legend that told that once he came home from his crusades, he wanted to meet up with the Countess Odierna of Tripoli. And during his journey, he was totally ill and his health was failing. Therefore, he pretty much died in the arms of his beloved. And from there, he has become quite the cultural icon, being mostly mentioned in a lot of poems from the 19th century, and of course, being involved in a play, and of course, this opera in particular. This opera was composed by Caia Sariajo, who was a very well-known Finnish composer, and the librettist was one Amin Malouf, who was a very well-known Lebanese French author. On top of that, this opera premiered at the Salzburger Festspiele on August 15, 2000, with a cast that involved Dwayne Croft, Don Upshaw, and Dagmar Pechkova, with Kent Nagano on the podium. The basic story goes on like this. Prince Geoffrey Roudel is extremely tired of having all of these earthly pleasures that he wants to search for something that has a lot more meaning to his life, like love from afar. At first, his old companions just take it off as a joke, but one fateful day, a young pilgrim arrives by boat and states that there is someone who definitely loves him from afar, and it is revealed to be the young countess of Tripoli, Clemence. At first, she thinks that his own declarations are really silly, but she becomes a lot more curious about this very interesting gentleman and wants to meet him in person as well, but feels that their love should be kept at a distance. During the climax of the opera, Geoffrey sails tirelessly from his home country of France to Tripoli, but his health is failing and therefore is almost on the verge of dying. And he approaches land just having his life slip away. And Countess Clemence notices his poor condition as he dies in her arms and she weeps claiming that he has been searching for love from afar all this time. From what I can tell from the story, this is a combination of Tristan und Isolde in terms of the star-crossed lovers and of course some elements of Debussy's Peleas et Melisande where we have a lot of these elusive elements, mostly in the form of the very elusive heroine of Countess Clemence de Tripoli. So you can definitely tell that there are a lot of elements used in this opera, and from what I could tell from the music, it is quite minimalistic, but serves its purpose wonderfully, with the occasional chorus at times speaking, and also giving off such fine vocalisms. 
And the music in general was quite minimalistic in its approach, mostly to heighten the mysterious nature that this opera has to offer. Going into the production, I have to say that it is quite mesmerizing in its own special way. What makes this production very striking is the juxtapositions used. Like we have a combination of modern and ancient folklore and real life, what's real and what's fantasy, and they just all come into play with really effective lighting, but at the same time, it doesn't really have a lot of sets to play off of. It just has very superb lighting, and one can tell that the juxtapositions used between modern and ancient are used really, really well in terms of the usage of LED lights, thus heightening a sense of mysticism, elusiveness, and an overall sense of beauty that manages to emit itself throughout the entire shebang. And the costumes look absolutely gorgeous on all of the characters, and they really fit all the characters wonderfully with each of the colors representing how they are as people, with Geoffrey's red attire representing himself as a noble who is passionate and who is very much on the verge of trying to achieve all of his lifelong dreams. The pilgrim, known in French as Le Pèlerin, dressed up in mostly cold colors, thus emitting something very mysterious. And Countess Clemence donning silver, stating that she is of noble blood. So you could definitely tell that the costumes and the entire production really know how to make a great use of all of these juxtapositions. And at the same time, the chorus also serves their purpose in really moving the action along whether they be swimming in this so-called sea or basically telling the characters of their impending fates and many other situations in between. So I'm not gonna mince words here. The production and costumes are quite mesmerizing in their own special ways and you really have to give it to Robert Lepage and Michael Curry who really knew how to immerse their creative minds into making something as elusive and mysterious as this particular production. Now we get to the singer, starting off with Eric Owen singing the role of Geoffrey Rudel. Now at first I was quite fearful for this particular singer because I've mainly known Eric Owens as an interpreter of all of these big, grand, dramatic bass baritone roles and I was quite fearful that his voice would have come off as rough or too edgy for a character like this. But he managed to use that rough tone to his advantage to bring out something that is so riveting. He was able to make Geoffrey quite sorrowful, yearning, and at the same time quite melancholic in his own special way. He is definitely a very melancholic character, and you have to give it to Eric Owens in terms of how he managed to bring this particular character to life with his own brand of melancholy and overall heroism to make this character come alive. It is definitely not an easy job to really portray this character with all of his nuances, all of his complexities, and just a great amount of nobility to make this character come alive. And I have to give it to Eric Owens. He is a very involving singing actor. I've seen him a couple of times, notably as Alberich and Orest from the Ring to Trilogy and Elektra respectively, and he is a very fine and consummate singing actor. And with the role of Geoffrey, he manages to pull off this particular character with flying colors thanks to his superb use of melancholy and his unique charm that he brings to this character. 
Le Pelleron, known in English as The Pilgrim, was sung by the superb mezzo-contralto Tamara Mumford, and she gives a certain amount of nobility, mystery, and ambiguity to this particular character, helped with the fact that she manages to make a great use of the so-called Sprechstimme in terms of how she was able to sing certain notes, and there are times they come off as spoken to really ensure that this character was not only a messenger or a bridge between the two tragic lovers, but also one who represents something of mystery, something of fate, something of destiny for these two characters to intertwine. And she plays this particular character very well, paying close attention to a lot of the complexities and a lot of the nuances that make the role of the pilgrim come alive. And her voice was an absolutely smoky and luscious instrument. It is a burnished timbre, which she manages to make a great use of, and she is just so commanding on stage that I was at the edge of my seat every time Madame Mumford was on stage singing the role of the pilgrim. Susanna Phillips was a superb Countess Clemence. I've seen this really awesome soprano on stage for quite some time, well, mostly on YouTube, and I've heard her sing a lot of roles from the coloratura soprano repertoire to the full lyric soprano repertoire. She specialized in roles like Lucia de la Mermur, Violetta Valeri, Fior de Ligi, Countess Alma Viva, Donna Anna, Donna Elvira, Pamina, and many other roles that are tailor-made to her superb lyric soprano voice, which is so capable of singing loads of coloratura. And her instrument is one of the most supple that I've ever heard. She also has a very elusive and mysterious stage presence, yet also one that is very regal and very much powerful in her own special way. She takes full command as the Countess, and she's just able to bring her youthful and gorgeous figure to life on stage, while at the same time giving off such excellent musicianship and excellent timing on all of the notes, and she has an overall pleasant voice which she uses from beginning to end, and all of her notes were just pitch perfect all throughout. So overall, the singers were at their tip-top form, and they really knew how to work exceptionally off of each other. And the conducting done by Maestra Susana Melki was absolutely superb. You can definitely tell that this is a conductor who really knows how to play close attention to all of the notes, all of the text, and she really knows how to bring this particular opera to life in terms of how she was handling the score, and the chorus and orchestra of the Metropolitan Opera House were, as to be expected, at their tip Top shape. So overall, Kaya Sariajo's L'Amour de Luan live from the Metropolitan Opera House was a definite treat. It was more than just a treat. It was a great trip that I managed to get myself into from beginning to end, and it was really riveting. I guess that's the right word to use for this particular opera production. It was riveting. The production and costumes were absolutely mesmerizing. All the singers were at their top form, the conducting was excellent, and of course the chorus and orchestra were in absolute fine form, and special kudos also has to go to Madame Kaya Sariajo and Amin Mulaf 
for such wonderful music and an equally grand opera. For those of you who have seen this opera, what did you think of it? Did you really love it? Was there a singer who stood out to you the most? Did you also love the score in particular? Comment below and let me know. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for my review of Jacques Offenbach's Le Comte d'Offman, live from the Royal Opera House, and also that of Wagner's Lohengrin, live from the Deutsche Oper Berlin. So until then, good night, everybody. <laughs>